Oi, what's the best game where you get to eat pie? Oi, what's the best game where you play a dead guy? Aye? You'll find I'm in DG247's podcast. Here, what's the best game where you swing from a rope? And what's the best game where you battle the Pope? Like I said, you will find out in this year podcast. Hello and welcome to VG247's Best Games Ever podcast, where we attempt to find the best game within an entirely arbitrary category that we've made up. For example, this week we're looking for the best game that you'd never believe was from that developer, uh, obviously inspired by Hi-Fi Rush, the shadow-dropped sort of jet-set radio style thingy that was uh, uh, completely surprised everyone uh, during a Microsoft Developer Direct uh, quite recently at the time of recording. There must be other games from developers that are surprising. So let's think of a few of them here. I'm joined today by Editor-in-Chief Tom Ory. Hello. Uh, and uh, staff writer Connor Macker. Hi. And uh, returning uh, <laughs> after... Uh, after uh, uh, You basically stepped aside for James Billcliffe to fill your slot, and I think you're regretting it, Alex. Well, I mean, he just, he's just, he manipulates people, so he wins. And it's, it's, he, worms it's his, he worms his way in to slots and mines, doesn't he, James? He's a, was, he's a bit of a worm. I was saying mm. this last week because I, I let him win with it, but I wasn't happy about it because mm. he picked Oblivion. And just to seal the deal, he brought up the fact that Patrick Stewart is like one of the first people you meet in Oblivion. Mm. And I was like, oh. It's so predictable if I pick it, but also he has made the best pitch. It's not good just because it's got Patrick Stewart in there. There's a TV series that's got Patrick Stewart in that I know of. That's, that's, really good. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely really cack. <laughs> yeah. But let's not, <laughs> let's not get into that because we'll be all fucking day. Um, all right. Okay. First of all, we are going to hear from, because you didn't get to go first last week, Tom, and I know you were annoyed about that as well because mm. you didn't get to steal Resi 4 off Kelsey and that's what you were it planning. wouldn't have been stealing, but yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Well, uh, okay. First of all, Tom, what is your yeah. pick for this right, topic? So I struggled with this topic quite a lot. I spent a long time I struggled researching. With every topic. Yeah. And I spent <laughs> ages Googling the exact name of the topic, see if anyone already answered it for me. Yeah. And I and then I went down, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go on Wikipedia pages yeah. for all the big developers. Put and it as see, a prompt on mid journey, see what it's see, see if I can find anything. And I thought, right, I'm keeping this too modern mm-hmm. and now it's very rare you get like a this kind of scenario. We had it recently, but it's not that often. So I went back to look at what surprised me in the past. So we've got to think of this from the era I'm going to be talking about. So we're like, let's go back to like early 90s, mm-hmm. right? A good era for like games because everything was new and exciting. And mm-hmm. we we're just we we're just sort of looking at like the next gen of like moving towards 3D stuff, like with like the 3DO and things. And mm-hmm. um, so... There was this a, is before your time, Connor, but just for reference, Will Smith was really cool mm, in, yeah, the, in the era that Tom's Will talking who? about. I so, think yeah. he's still I think he's still still decently cool. Oh, depending, no, on, the depending, on anything, stance, depending on your stance of on punching people. If mm. anything, he's cooler now than he's this been is, in a while. This is derailing my story. <laughs> right, sorry, Connor. All right. So it was uh nineteen ninety-four. We're in like a period where Mortal Kombat was a big deal mm. and people were trying to make a uh, game similar to that because they wanted a bit of that Mortal Kombat money. So there was a game made for the 3DO called Way of the oh, Warrior. God. Right? Way of the Warrior. And that is a not particularly great... Now, this is, I know there's going to be arguments about this, but this... Is, stay, stay I mean, this. it's shite. It's, Let's not not it's not a particularly <laughs> great fighting game, right? And that is from Naughty Dog, right? Naughty Dog. Yeah. Thing is, this is not the end of the story, right? So this is not my choice. Where the warrior? It's just a bit of background. Like Naughty Dog were making some not great games. They just got by making some stuff. They made a Lord of the Rings Mega Drive game, um, which is you know, sort of RPG, not particularly great. Where the warrior, which is like uh, a kind of h- home bodge together Mortal Kombat copy, <laughs> not particularly good. <laughs> Um, so they were like not the best studio ever, but they were getting by, um, churning mm. out some stuff. So they went from Where the Warrior, a violent Mortal Kombat clone, essentially, to Crash Bandicoot. So Crash Bandicoot is my choice as a game that you, that's kind of a surprise from that developer because they literally went from proper, violent, grim, bad 
fighting game to much loved PlayStation mascot part of the success of the whole console game, Crash Bandicoot, which is a fun 2D slash 3D platform game. Um, that went on to be like a massive, massive franchise. Um, so I think as a as a switch from what they were doing to what they did, I think there can be few bigger surprise games than Crash Bandicoot. It's, it's a hell of a pivot. Mm. Um, and it's not the argument I thought you were going to make. Cause, no. Uh, but I want to point out that this also works backwards because you, you look at, I mean, you, you know, people who, um, a lot of people just, I mean, you know, quite rightly, not complaining, a lot of people just play video games and enjoy them and don't think about them beyond, like, you know, the surface level, like, quite like quite like Crash Bandicoot, quite like FIFA, whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, not many people are going to make the connection between Crash Bandicoot and The Last of Us, right? Um, I reckon probably the vast majority of people enjoying The Last of Us TV show would be surprised if you told them, you know that game Crash Bandicoot? This is from this is this is the same people. They um, would, but I wanna say, you know, I think I think there's a linear I mean, I understand Tom's argument for Crash, but I think from Crash there's quite a a natural lineage from Crash as a as a two point five D, let's call it, platformer to Jack, which is this um, third-person shooter platformer to un- with a cartoon character, mm-hmm. to Uncharted, which is a third-person shooter platformer with a hyper-realistic character, to The Last of Us, which is this grounded action with an Uncharted, don't forget, had stealth elements, to mm. The Last of Us, which is a third-person action game with stealth elements but they've taken the platforming yeah. away and it's, it's really a telegram and chart isn't it and so i yeah and so i feel like there is almost the the, the i do think the arc of naughty dog mm. starts at crash and it doesn't really start with you are right where the warrior or the lord of the rings game or they had they did like a point and click game um that i can't remember the name of um there was like a dos game and things like that and you're right, the, the the lineage of Naughty Dog sort of starts at Crash, but I think, although someone would be shocked if they just watched the HBO program and you said, this is the last, this is the uh, Crash Bandicoot people, <laughs> I do think if you take it in as a whole, you look at that arc and you're like, oh yeah, this makes sense. One of mm-hmm. Each one of these games led to the next, led to the next one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a very interesting evolution for a studio, and it make it, it well, yeah. On on uh, a surface reading of it, it, it it's surprising, but as you say, when you get into the granularity of it, it makes perfect sense. But but I do think um, I do think Tom's right. I think uh, if you look at it from either end, I think a lot of people would be surprised by that kind of. I think vector. it's equivalent. To, like if NetherRealm just decided to make a a cutesy platformer, we'd be well surprised, wouldn't we? So yeah. let's hear from. Connor, what's your pick for this one? Well, I'm so glad that you started off this podcast with Hi-Fi Rush because Mm. my pick for the developer is not a company as a developer, but a person as a developer of games, Shinji Mikami. Yeah. Because before he did all his very well-known horror games and horror titles and that sort of thing. Before you get onto your pick, can you do a quick rundown of his career? Okay, so in like the late 90s, we did Resident Evil. So when I was born in 1998, he released Resident Evil 2. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Just having a moment. Yeah. All right. Oh, it's uh, that, uh, he was he was around my house the other day and he, he, he just blurted out, oh yeah, when 9-11 happened, I was three and I melted into a puddle on the floor. Anyway, sorry, carry on, Connor. <laughs> No, it's totally fun. Uh, Dino <laughs> Crisis, all like Resident Evil 3, and then he went on to do stuff like Devil May Cry, you know, yeah. all these kind of like adult focused action ho- games, like a lot of horror, obviously. He's known mm-hmm. primarily for horror. RE4, he went on to make like Evil Within, which I don't think he and his team were happy to make, but Evil Within 2 was really good. And he recently made Hi Fi Rush, which everyone's like, wow, you know, what a vibrant, different game for. Tango Gameworks to make, but at the start of Sh- of Shinji Mikami's career, he made Who Framed Roger Rabbit. <laughs> Two years later, he'd make Goof Troop and Disney's Aladdin. But Who Framed Roger Rabbit was the first of these kind of weird Disney games. Shinji I Mikami played made. that. 
I played Did that. you really? Yeah. In 1991. I played that. A friend had it. And it's really, it's like a, unless, unless, I mean, there were loads at that back then used to get licensed games that were completely different on different platforms. I don't know which, if this was just, if there was only one or not. But mm. I'm sure it was like a sort of point and clicky type thing. Maybe I've got getting the wrong game, but um, I remember playing this at a friend's house. And it was all right, actually. Fair enough. Like, admittedly, I also struggled a lot with like what to pick here because all of the developers I'd go to have either always made the same game forever or like. What did he do before and after this? So I think before Shinji Mikami. <sighs> I need to look this up because I literally just like last night pulled Who Friend Roger Rabbit as like a that's the one. Uh, he did a quiz game, I think. Let me just. Check. Do you know what else he did that I know off the top of my head because I actually was thinking about it when I was talking about Hi Fi Rush and I uh, did the write up on the site. Oh yeah, I talked a bit about Mikami's background. Uh, yeah, he did the one of the all time greats in my opinion, a game before your time. But he did the Capcom Aladdin game. Which I think a lot of people, uh, to to people my age, uh, that was a golden era of like platformers and, and things that were Disney tie-ins. But that Aladdin game, the Mega Drive version only, the Super Nintendo version, not as good. But the Mega Drive version specifically of Aladdin is strongly considered to be one of the best uh, games of its kind of its time. Um, yeah, it's just like this really interesting patch of like mm. kids-focused Disney games. He did Goof the- Troop as well. At the start of this, like yeah. massive. Connor mentioned both of those. Alex. I did. I did mention both of those games. <laughs> I'm just sorry. Like... I just I was, I was zoning out because I was thinking about it. But like, this is really, <laughs> this is really neat. Kind of weird patch of like kids games at the start of this like kind of legendary beloved horror career. Yeah. Of, yeah. Like. Action but here's here's my stage. here's here's my counter argument to this. Right. Go for it. Mm-hmm. Was this not the was this not the path for almost all Japanese creators back in those ga- days? Like I, they I sort would, of, I they ended know. up on, I mean, Capcom did a lot of licensed stuff, but just yeah. in general, a lot of the creators that you think of, um, Kamiya is probably like, I don't know this, but I'm, I'm like literally typing his name into Wikipedia now. Like, cause I bet there's like a string of weird little, Actually, no, he starts with Resident Evil, I guess, because of yeah. his age, because he's younger. Yeah. Or I, I wouldn't know about like the like the history of Japanese development. Obviously, I'm but a child relative to you lot. But to me, I was just um. doing research. <laughs> I was like looking through, and it was just so shocking to me that obviously I know Shinji Mikami for horror, like for this for scary games, for very adult games, and just seeing like Aladdin, uh, Goof Troop. Uh, who framed Roger Rabbit, right? Was just like, well, that's odd. And it, it's, it, it's, it isn't the sort of name I would imagine on those sorts of games, which fit the brief. I'd so did he go after, just to be clear on the timeline, because I think this is important yeah. for this podcast, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, then he went on to do the Disney stuff for like the, the platformers, right? It was Who Framed Roger Rabbit in 91, and then it was Goof Troop and Disney's Aladdin. Yeah, so that's, that's quite a a decent little normal path, right? That doesn't seem like, oh my God, can't believe the Roger Rabbit guy did uh, Aladdin. If you're trying to like, swap yeah, that's, over, that's if, you're what... tra- if, if you're trying to swap that sort of point Alex made to you from like Crash to Naughty Dog Modern Games, I think there's not really a connection between who framed Roger Rabbit and Disney's Aladdin or that to yeah, but, I mean, Evil. If you're like, you know like, the irony, you know the irony, I think, I think you picked the wrong game Mikami was involved in for me because I think when you look at his CV, the shocking thing is how he was uh, like crucial to the creation of uh, Ace Attorney. Oh, yeah. That's, and, th- and that comes all after Resident Yeah, Evil lucky Dino Connor. Crisis. That, I wouldn't have argued with that at all. I think that... Never mind, Connor. i tell you what, I actually think that the uh, that wouldn't be so much of a pivot for me because um, Ace Attorney... Uh, is like borderline horrific in terms of its uh, yeah. like some of the character motivations and and some of the the leaps of logic required to exonerate certain people and uh, um, it's like it's a deeply troubling game sometimes when you um, when you when you get into the uh, get into some of the logic of uh, a lot of how the cases are solved um, but uh, let's not get into that. 
because we'll be here all day once again. But um, no, I think that's uh, I think that's quite a pivot. And like, I'm just imagining, you know, I'm just imagining somebody who isn't like, you know, massively into games to the point where they know stuff about game directors and just like your normal. Uh, my criteria for this internally is just like your normal average sort of person on the street. And I think, yeah, I you know, uh, uh, it's probably not likely that your average person in the street is going to remember who framed Roger Rabbit on the NES. But yeah, but if we're talking average person on the street, you can say any old shit all the time because they're all morons, aren't they? That's not true, yeah. is it, Tom? I'm true. just talking. <laughs> I'm just going to. Every argument from now on is well, the average person in the street wouldn't think that, Jim. Uh, no, no, I, I, I'm not. I'm not applying that to every single episode. It's I just, am now. That's well, it. That's I'm in not, my well, book now. Well, you can. Well, you can if you want, but it's not mm. going to win you any episodes, is it? All right, Donaldson. Uh, what is your pick for this well, episode? I, I said to you beforehand, like, this was an interesting one because it's very rare that an episode comes up where, like, I'm mm. instantly, like, I can think of eight, ten games. And so there were things where, like, there were mm. games that my heart went to. So I've mentioned it on this podcast before, but there's, like, um, there's Racing Lagoon, which is a, uh, basically Square Enix's take on, a, on, on Ridge Racer, and it's this weird racing RPG. But the thing about that is it's still an RPG, so even though at a first glance it doesn't look like a Square Enix game, you quickly realise, oh, this has got a story written by the guy who wrote Final Fantasy VII. So I put that one aside. Um, then I thought about one of the all-time greats, in my opinion, and I very nearly picked this, uh, and that's, of course, Rockstar Games Table Tennis. Um, you know, they had a new engine, they had, they had a new engine and they, they wanted to test it. Uh, they built a table tennis game to test their new physics engine. And literally we're just like, this is probably good enough that we could polish it up, add some stuff to it and release it. It was great. That's a right? brilliant, and it's a really it's good brilliant. game. Yeah, I yeah. had that when I was, a, yeah, I was one of my first games there. It was brilliant. That's a, that's a, that's a, I think, yeah, that, that, that is a re- genuinely a really good game. I would, I would play a remaster of that game if anyone at Rockmaster is, Rockmaster, uh, Rockstar's listening. Um, <laughs> I also Master. thought about, um, I also thought about Mini Ninjas. So that mm. obviously was an IP um, from uh, IO Interactive. So the Hitman guys, and it's like, um, cutesy platformer thing sort of a bit like I, I, it's been a, a million years since i played it but it's sort of uh in my mind it was like a lego star wars sort of vibe um and that was like popular enough that it got a i think it had there was there was there was two seasons of a cartoon based on it mm-hmm. um which is wild in itself and obviously they put that out at the same time as like Kane and Lynch, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and 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 after a bunch of Hitman games, um, yeah. And then I thought about doing a retroactive one, like Tom, and talking about how if you took Jazz Jackrabbit and said this is this is developed and created by the guys behind Gears of War, you'd go, what the hell? But in the <laughs> end, this podcast is about the best game, and so. I really had to choose what I think is an obvious option to the point where I was worried that someone else would have picked it. Uh, and that's Alien Isolation. Um, now, Creative Assembly, of course, just run down their history. Um, mm. They started out and they were, you know, founded in the late 80s, early 90s. And they did a lot of like work for hire. And they did some of like the earliest versions of like FIFA and rugby games and cricket games and stuff like that. And then after they'd been around for you know about a decade a little over a decade they sort of got their break and in between making uh rugby games of questionable quality and with very little sales potential they made shogun total war and that changed the direction of the studio then and so they made total war game after total war game for you know well over a decade there were a couple of weird little bits in there so like they did the porting of the old sonic games to the nintendo ds when they put like sonic 1 and sonic 2 on ds um and they had one game in there an action game um, a third person action game that's sort of a god of war alike um they had that one game in there that was like their detour and that was the team that then went on to make this alien game um and it's just, this is a studio where you look at everything else they've done. It's either real-time strategy or sports, or they did a couple, they've done a couple over the years of third-person action games, God of war that sort of ply 
the stuff that they built for Total War, where they could perhaps reuse some assets and reuse some expertise because it's all about swords and, and sorcery or, you know, and, and, and swords and sandals, I guess, as I say, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then in the middle of it, out of nowhere, after dropping, I'm going to count down, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, <laughs> twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen... Uh, 15 real-time strategy games, all of a ve- of a very similar, um, 15 no, 16 real-time strategy games, all of a very similar style, except for one that was a boring Chris one Pratt a games, isn't it? Yeah, boring Chris Pratt games, and making tools for <laughs> Time Commanders on the BBC. Speaking of <laughs> speaking of Pratt, and <laughs> and yeah, and then they dropped this Alien game that's a first person, never made a first person game before, survival horror, never made a survival horror game before. Um, just horrifying and wonderful and one of the best games of its generation. Excellent, completely unexpected. And then they finished that and then went back to making one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight real-time strategy games. (laughs) So even though it was hugely successful, the studio was like, and now we go back to what we actually do. And so it's got to be Alien Isolation for me just because of how 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 it slots in and yeah what it is like it's just it's it, it even now like a lot of the times when you have this like to tom's point right they made um they made that game they made crash and like i argued earlier there's then a an arc from crash to what they do now it Crash is a natural part of where of that studio's lineage that studio's growth that studio's history um and I would argue to some extent, I think for a lot of Japanese creators, I think there's definitely a, um, of, of, of a certain, of a certain age anyway, I think there's a, there's a definite standard thing where you would slave away on some slightly weird, uh, esoteric stuff or some licensed stuff or whatever. It's like the director of Breath of the Wild, his first game was like a Tetris game for instance, when everyone was making a million Tetris games for the Game Boy. And this is still, it's still an outlier still to this day. It's one of the highest regarded games of all time. And yet it's still like this odd, oddball. In it's the, in the, it's, in the it's a random games. banger. And when you look at their list, when you look at the list of um, of Creative Assembly games after Alien Isolation, you're immediately back to Total War Attila, Total War Warhammer, Halo Wars, Total War Warhammer 2, Total War Saga, Total War Three Kingdoms. Can we, <laughs> like, just, can we just bring... I want to just bring up one point, mm-hmm. and that is, if we're talking about the best games ever, right? Mm-hmm. Best games. So they've got to be pretty much universally loved, these games. Right? Isolation is universally loved. I don't think, I don't think it is. I mean... Just, more universally loved than Crash Bandicoot. Just have a look at the review for Alien Isolation on IGN. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I think. I, mean, I think. And they're, I think and they're many one of the biggest in the world. How could we argue with them, right? Yeah. I think, exactly. I think, I think Alien Isolation is one of those games where I think it's fair to say that at the time of its release, quite a lot of people didn't get it, but it has over the years now been rehabilitated. <laughs> And I think, um, <laughs> and you could see that at the time because, yeah, you are correct. Like IGN gave it like a six, didn't they? And, yeah. Uh, but you know, um, I'm just. You, I mean, you I have no websites problem giving it five stars. No it problem 10 with that 10. review. I mean, it's just, it just, it just strikes me as odd that we're saying this is one of the best games ever when it got a five point nine. When IGN IGN. gave it a six, is that how you? Is that where you're going? So <laughs> it seems a bit. I don't, I'm just. That's why they got it on IGN six. Putting that out there um, as a, a possible issue with this choice. Do you remember many, many, many moons ago, Tom, when we were mm. in a not that dissimilar a life to this one, but a different mm. life nonetheless, when uh, when the reviews for Alien Isolation hit and one of our colleagues, who I won't name, has uh, gave it like a 10, I think, um, for, for the site we were working on. Mm. And uh, a very rare 10 for that person. We might have given it a 9, I can't remember. Um and uh, and then the IGN review hit, and and there was a very, uh, very noticeable split between British outlets and American outlets mm. in terms of how mm. they scored it. And all the American outlets were like, "Well, this is boring because you don't fucking shoot anything." And all the British outlets were like, "This is this is a masterpiece of, this is a masterpiece of terror," and it was. 
it was reflective of the difference between alien and aliens, right? You know, like yeah. a, a, a Alien is is a, a British alien film, and Aliens is an American version of that concept. That it, it, like it, it's it's about a team of Marines, you know, uh, and they're all very gung ho, and and now there's like twelve aliens, and and they're they're coming for you, and it's like fucking Jaws. Right? Well, look, there was there was and, an Aliens game from Americans, and it was Colonial Marines. That's all I'm saying. Well, yeah, yeah and that, that, half of them loved that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, I just, I, I love, I love that difference between the, the, the two mindsets and how like it wasn't the first time that the Aliens franchise had highlighted that sort of psychological difference between the two cultures. Um, anyway, just, just looking at the creative assembly, you are right. They do just like every few years release a totally different, it's like they've got this bubbling desire to make something different. They, they have, they, they have the hyenas always, that, 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 like, well, that's that, still coming. That, right? that, that's they're coming making this that year. this year, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm. But it's like, like a, it's like a team based shooter. So the way I understand it is, <laughs> is that, is that creative assembly is basically two teams and to keep people fresh, you get to rotate out of the, out of the RTS team every so often and go on the, and the, the secondary team back in the day was the team that was making sports games or whatever, I guess. There was a yeah. great, you lovely. know what? I hate to say it. Well, I don't hate to say it because he's a lovely person, but there was a great documentary about Creative Assembly, and I'm pretty sure it was Pratt. <laughs> it, <laughs> was Pratt. Yeah, it was Pratt. On people make games. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and he talks about this. He talks about how, you know, it evolved into a two team setup and all that sort of stuff. But even if you just look at, if you assume that all the RTSs are all one team and all the other games are all another team, even then, you look at what that other team's done, and mm. and Alien Isolation comes out of nowhere because before that they'd done the it official does. London Olympics game, they'd <laughs> done um, a port of some Sonic games, they'd yeah. done Storm Rise, which was a weird console RTS that sort of flopped, mm-hmm. um, and they did Viking Battle for Asgard, which, like I mentioned, was a was a God of War knockoff. I really liked a pretty that, good but it was God very of War mid. knockoff. I, I enjoyed yeah, that, yeah. but it was, yeah. it, was, it, was just, it was like a Fifty Cent Blood on the Sand sort of. Sort yeah, of vibe. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, it had so, as I remember, Viking Battle for Asgard had a lot of Asgard, Asgard. Sorry, Asgard, <laughs> like a. You've got to guard your ass. <laughs> like, yeah. a, like an American football outfit. Um, uh, it had a lot of really good uh, limb severing mechanics, I thought. Um, anyway, uh, but uh, just going through, um, um, we're going to wrap this up in a second, but uh, just going backwards through the Creative Assembly catalog i think is quite funny if you take storm rise as your starting points you've got empire total war a uh, viking battle for asgard and you've got like just total war total war total war total war total war and then rugby <laughs> <laughs> um on the playstation 2 which um yeah sports rugby yeah yeah they they sports want to make rugby and you yeah. imagine that it's it's sort of like the the most humble beginnings for this studio that I think is now a really mm. a really big British success story because those yeah. rugby games they didn't have big budgets because nobody bought them because they were irrelevant for ninety percent of the worldwide audience they only really sold in the Six Nations yeah to people Small in markets. sorry um, all right okay well we're gonna play that jingle that says we have to I have to pick something. <laughs> All three of these choices are really good. You say that every time. No, no, no. no. Every time I lose, you say that. Just just before you carry on, Jim, Alex, I think, has been trying to paint this narrative of, like, no. Long a long path through all these developers. We're talking about one game to another game being a big shift, right? That is true. Yeah. And I don't mm. care about like how oh in the end you can see the lineage going through all the games yeah, but, and the through yeah, path is very is... clear. Ignore that. That's to try and cover over the fact that he knows my choice is really good, right? A violent Mortal Combat clone to Crash Bandicoot. If you know I've got total... you've got Whiplash. If, well that, here's the you? thing here's the thing I'd say to that is at that time. Naughty Dog was a studio in search of its identity, and what it did was basically try to make its own version of the most popular thing at the time that everybody was doing. There were hundreds of Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter clones. The interesting thing is, Alien Isolation was made at a time when survival horror was sort of on its ass. That was when Resident Evil was getting really shit. You know, in this pre Resident Evil. Give it a real world. shot on the arm. If we're, kind of if, if we're taking it. Alex's point about Japanese developers all working on licensed weird stuff, then not all, I, but I, it was a common a, thing. A, a, a common thing. I'm pretty confident in saying that if that if that's the case, then a, a damn lot of like Western developers were making shitty Mortal Kombat games. Right. Or, okay. Like, look. Right. 
like okay, I'm, I'm going to break it down. So the thing, the the Connor, the the, th- the main thing that counts against yours is that, uh, and you're right, it is a massive pivot from Disney tie-in to the like endless career of horror and horror themed bangers that Shinji Mikami has been up to. But because he was a big Capcom personality. Now, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, the thing that you saw the Capcom logo in front of more often than not was like some kind of Disney tie-in. So like, um, it's not that out of the ordinary for uh, a big Capcom guy to have cut his teeth on stuff like that. He picked the wrong game. If he picked the one before the horror games, you'd have been all right, I reckon. See, this is kind of like, I suppose too late. It's too late I, suppose, now. I suppose you doesn't just mean normal people. It means normal people over the age of 30. I, I guess I didn't know that. I suppose I, you, you are getting into esoteric Japanese uh, knowledge of, of Japan. But for instance, I want to give another example, which is like um, there was a McDonald's game on the NES, a licensed McDonald's game that is a surprisingly good platformer where you play as Ronald McDonald. And that was made by... <laughs> That was made by Treasure, um, and mm. the producer on that game uh, was the, like the boss uh, behind Guardian Heroes and Ikaruga and Radiant Silvergun. <laughs> That's why it's so hard to pick good picks against Alex. He's like he's plugged into the Matrix. He's like ten good options. I, 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 Trish, I didn't know that. I didn't know that off the top of my head, but I knew that, oh, that McDonald's I knew game. About this McDonald's I knew that, game that, that I knew that McDonald's the game existed. Guy. So like, I, who knows that? <laughs> no, but I knew that I knew the McDonald's game existed, and I knew it was Japanese. So I just quickly googled it and was like, "Who is the director?" Why did you review it when you were like thirteen years old or something? <laughs> I was. I wouldn't have even. I don't think I was even born when that game came out. Excuse me. Oh no, I was born. I would have been four. <laughs> Square Enix sent him to Tokyo as a four-year-old to review. Um, all right. Okay. Like, let's let's wrap this up. Right. Uh, uh, okay. So, uh, Alien Isolation. Oh, it's. I would say Alien Isolation is. The best five point, game. Five point nine out of ten. I would say uh, Alien Isolation <laughs> is far and away the best game, and it is a pivot. It is probably so good. Big, so good. It has so a fucking many, butt coming here, though. So many followers. It up, is the it? biggest. It Crash is Bandicoot. the biggest pivot. It is the biggest pivot uh, for a studio out of out of all of these. Um, is uh, it? It is. Yes. Okay. And um, the the Crash Bandicoot one. Uh, okay. It's a. It's a. It is a pivot from the immediately previous game, but I don't think, I don't think it's that surprising when you when you. I was a take big naughty dog fan back in the early nineties. Yeah, and I expected oh, God, the next were. game to be Absolute, another fighting oh, game. Yeah, I bet you were like, oh yeah, I really loved this Mortal Kombat clone that nobody fucking remembers. Oh, I, was, I really wanted to get it for the 3D. Rubbish. I didn't own. I would actually, if Connor had said, yeah, yeah, I really, I really dig this ancient fucking Mortal Kombat clone, I would have believed it from Connor. I, People I don't have been like, it. you need to stop saying fighting games. You'll want to know. <laughs> and then Tom brings up Way of the Warrior, and I'm like, oh, I, I know Way of the Warrior. Right. It's dog shit. I played it on an emulator. I think. There's so see? many shitty Mortal Kombat games. I would uh see I would have believed it from Connor. But I tell you what, and, and uh the only the only good thing about Way of the Warriors is that it reminds me of uh the opening two parts of Deep Space Nine season four, which has the same title. Uh, it's when Worf joins the cast. It's really good, um, but look, look, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, and I'm really sorry, and I know a lot of people are going to be very upset, right, Connor? I'd have loved to have given it to you, but Alien Isolation is, it's the one. It's got to be. It's like it's, it's a slam dunk for this topic. I didn't think of it at first. I didn't think of it at first. I was, I was ready to say table tennis. And it was oh, quite don't rub it into the other two. It was so, quite I mean, late Tom's always like, annoyed because yeah, he never go wins. Through, go through the other four winning picks. You can <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. Polygon gave I'll, Alien Isolation a six point five, and they were meant to be the future of games journalism. So you know, <laughs> what do we know? <laughs> you know. I just want to say, of all the, I just want to say, by the way, of all the, uh, of all the shitty Mortal Kombat clones from back in the day. Because uh, everyone was making them, like we said. I just want to give a shout out to Jackie Chan in Fists of Fire, which was a fighting game where uh, oh, seven of the eight characters or nine. Characters Have you played that as well, Connor? Where Jackie There's a Chan. community of people who play that like every week. <laughs> I think there's yeah. multiple, this is a fighting game where there's multiple versions of Jackie Chan and they literally don't even have different names. They're just called like Drunken Fist Jackie, yeah. Admiral Jackie, mm-hmm. you know, Homeless Jackie, whatever. 
I'm going back. I'm going back to the old ways. After my this podcast. favorite uh, Mortal Kombat clone is that weird one with the the, the, the clay stop motion. Um, clay fire. Oh, clay fire. Clay fire. Yeah. The big uh, Santa of his gut out, like yeah. all over the place. <laughs> I would actually point out because t- uh, uh, Connor, I think at some point Tom rattled you by by telling you you, you always go on about fighting games. Yeah. And when you stopped going out on about fighting games, I lost every episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think you need to start like leveraging. Yeah your fighting game knowledge I'm going, I'm going back just go to the really original hard. strategy of just 100%. being the most boring person to listen to on this podcast <laughs> <laughs> Right. Okay. Look, we got to leave it there. Please uh, uh, leave us a five star review on your podcast platform of choice because uh, if you don't, then we're just going to stop making them because we only do it for um, the validation of uh, val- yeah for validation um, and. Um, yeah uh, and also uh, please join us next week we don't know what the topic is yet but it's almost definitely going to be one that Tom disapproves of and loses <laughs> like I said you will find out in this year podcast if you enjoyed the show please give us a five star review wherever you get your podcast it really helps us get the word out uh, we're not just a podcast of course if you'd like to hear more from the team then check out vg247.com for our fantastic news coverage features reviews and game guides thank you so much for listening goodbye transport links are pretty great here in scotland your cars and aeroplanes therefore norms man you are across the fourth of day there's only Glasgow Central and Rakeithing Bathgate Bethel. What did I just jump onto a Scott Rail? Why? Your drum words, get yourself on Scott Rail. This daft joke won't travel well, but Scott Rail. Sam, wake up, man.